thank you all very much for for joining remotely for also your flexibility and yeah i'll be talking about my work that i did in the past four years within the crowd water project um i will talk a bit about motivations of citizen scientists i will talk about the accuracy of crowd-based data and also the potential of that data for hydrological model Um, okay so yeah in hydrology it's all about water as you can see on this slide and you can also see on this slide that water um, can become a threat to life if we have too much of it just like with the current virus spreading um, but on the other hand water is also or it's also a threat to to life a potential threat if there's too little water around, just at, at you see, at, as you can see on this image of the Rhine in 2018 of the partly dry riverbed. And on top of that, the pollution of water is also a threat to, to human life. So in order to be um, able to manage these water resources in a, in a good way, we need to have information on the amounts of water in the stream. So we need to know when there is how much water in which stream. Uh, globally, the problem is that there's less and less actual recent data available. And you can see on this map that um, the darker the points are, the more recent is the data. So you see that we have a lot of recent data in the more developed countries in uh, Northern America and Europe. And in many parts of the world, there's very few recent data available. And on top of that, um, the access to national data sets, so from authorities, is increasingly becoming uh, restricted. That might be due to the fear of misuse of that data or um, just because of the lack of the infrastructure or the knowledge on how to share it and for also the awareness. And then for the regions where the data is actually missing, those regions are also often the regions where the where there are actually bigger problems in terms of hydrology. So for example, the Andes, uh, sorry, the Himalayas and the Andes, where there's um, problems with climate change, glacial lake, outburst floods, and so on. And there we, we are missing a lot of data actually. So in the best case, um, the situation would, would look like this. We would have a beautiful stream and we would have some infrastructure and some personnel taking the measurements, taking care of the infrastructure and working on the data. But as we just saw on the map, um, there's in many places it just looks like this. There's nothing there. It looks beautiful, but we also don't have information on um, on that stream, on the water quantities in that stream. But what we usually have is is people in the close uh, vicinity of of such a stream, because if we define some stream or the behavior of some stream problematic, it's usually a problem because there's people that are who are affected by this. And there, in the Project Crowdwater, we thought citizen science would be a good solution, a good approach to try to solve these problems. So citizen science is defined as scientific work undertaken by members of the general public, often in collaboration with or under the direction of professional scientists and scientific institutions. So what does it mean? I mean, um, we thought we could equip people, local people, with a tool that so they can collect the data potentially for themselves or for, for other people. And if we equip many people with the right tool that has a lot of potential to actually collect a lot of data that otherwise wouldn't be collected. So in the project Crowdwater, our aim was to develop such a tool. So we would need a tool to collect information on stream flow quantities in streams. And the easiest way and maybe a bit naive way is to just go out and ask people how much water do you think is right now flowing in this stream? But that's exactly what we did. And we went out in 2016 and 2017 to 10 rivers in Switzerland and asked more than 500 people to estimate the stream flow. Um, we asked them to estimate the width and the average depth and the flow velocity in these streams. So these um, three quantities and then calculated the stream flow from their estimates but as you can imagine this is pretty difficult to do and the accuracy might be quite large so at the same time we also 
showed them such an image that is an image of one of those rivers and it has a virtual stuff gauge um, pasted on it, like a sticker from WhatsApp or Snapchat or one of the currently used apps. And this virtual stuff gauge has 10 classes. And if you paste this on a river and on a picture of a, of a reference image that you can use to go to the same river again at a later point in time and then decide on the water level based on this image. So for example, if you go to that river again, the limit in Zurich in this case, and the water level would be above this black um, spot here on the wall, you could say, okay, today it's in class four, for example. And if you do that multiple times, you get kind of a time series of the water level changes. So the results of these estimates, you see here on top the results of the stream flow estimates via the vista depth and the flow velocity. You see that the spread in these estimates is really large. So you see on the most extreme cases, it was 10,000 times overestimated or underestimated. So that was the overestimation of the citizens compared to the measurements that was uh, taken at the same point in the river. Um, so that's quite an uncertainty in, in those estimates. And the results of the water level class estimates were far more encouraging, actually. That was a really good news. So you see on this graph that about 50% of all the people estimated class correctly, and that another 40% estimated the class within plus or minus one class. So about 90% of all people estimated um, plus minus one of the correct class. So based on these results, we then wanted to check what is actually the potential of that data for hydrological modeling. Can it be used to calibrate hydrological modeling, hydrological models if, if for example, time series have these inaccuracies from the estimates of, of people, of citizen scientists? So a small excursion for those of you who don't know what hydrological modeling actually is. Um, a hydrological model is a representation of a landscape, of a catchment in computer code, basically. And the, the catchment is divided into boxes, as you can see here, for example, boxes for snow, for the soil, for the groundwater. And all these boxes are um, characterized by different parameter sets. And these parameter sets tell us something or define how the water is transferred or stored in these boxes. For example, in the soil, how much water can the soil take in before the water leaks out? Um, this model is, has to be fed with weather data, so it needs precipitation, potential evaporation, and temperature that we can feed into the model. And then the model produces a simulation of stream flow. That the stream flow that is as we saw, the amount of water at a given point in time in a stream. But how do we know that this stream flow is actually a, a good simulation, that the simulation is good, that it actually re represents the real stream flow? So for that, we need an observation of, or measurements actually, of real stream flow, so that we can adjust the model to fit this, this measured stream flow as good as possible. For that, we can change the parameters until we are satisfied with the simulation of the model compared to the measured stream flow. And if we then have a calibrated model, we can use this model to make a um, flood forecast, for example. We just need a weather forecast that we can feed into the model and then we can, for example, give out flood warnings to authorities to, for example, evacuate people or pile up sandbags. So, and we now in CrowdWater tried to find a, a solution to collect measured stream flow data. So in this study, um, uh, I chose four catchments in Switzerland and calibrated each of these catchments in, with one year, with one wet year, with one dry year, and one average year, and then cross-validated um, these calibrations with another wet, another dry, and another average year, so that in total we had nine year combinations per catchment. Um, what would you, did we use for calibration? Because we only had a, this error distribution from the street surveys, and we also had measured stream flow from the Federal Office of the Environment in Switzerland. So we then um, 
took this measured stream flow that you see here, the blue line, and we synthetically added the noise that you would get if people would estimate the stream flow based on the street surveys. So that's what you get. It's a lot of uncertainty, a lot of noise in that hourly stream flow data. So, and that an hourly resolution is not really um, realistic for citizen science because we don't have sensors, we have people who actually need to be there. And therefore we selected 52 um, observations per year. So on average one observation per week, but we made it a bit more likely to get observations during summer when the people are more outdoors compared to winter. Yeah, with that, um, with, this, with that data set, with that stream flow data, with uh, that um, looks a bit like um, if people had uh, estimated it, we calibrated our models. And so the first, um, the one here in this graph, the result is, um, this is the result of the stream flow, the hourly stream flow, the, so the upper benchmark. This is basically the situation, the best possible situation that you can, that you can get if you have measured hourly stream flow. And the worst situation you can get is you have no data at all. So that is a non-calibrated model with, uh, with just random parameter sets that stands for a situation where you don't have any data at all. So now you see the result here of the calibration with stream flow estimates you know, on a weekly resolution. And you see that you're not really any better than with uh, uh, random parameters with uh, non-calibrated models, basically. So this shows us that the noise in the data was just too much to be useful for model calibration. But we had this other thing with the water level class estimates. And there we did a similar procedure to create data for model calibration. So here again, you have uh, water level, water level data actually in this case, not stream flow, but water level data. And we classified this water level data into classes. You see this red line with the steps. It has a, it's now resolved in classes and not in very um, precise water level data. From these, we also selected 52 points to have a more realistic temporal resolution. And then we are still lacking the errors from the, from the surveys. So we um, put that synthetically on top of these um, estimates. You see some of the classes, if I go back again, you see that some were now one class off and others are still on the correct class. So we also calibrated the model with this data and um, so we have again the old one from the previous uh, calibration. And here you see that we are actually in a range where we are significantly better compared to a situation without any stream flow data. So this is good news. And we see that there is a potential of this water level class estimates for hydrological model calibration. And here's a short summary of that in a comic. So you see um, people estimated stream flow and this was not really good for model calibration, but they also estimated based on the virtual stuff gauge with classes and this data can actually be used for hydrological model calibration. So I'm um, giving you now a short commercial break um, where I'm going to introduce the Crowdwater app to you. This app was developed in the time we were out and did these surveys. And with this app, you can now collect um, water level class data based on the approach of this virtual stuff gauge. It's also a bit of a social network. You can like and share and follow other users. So how does it work to add a water level class estimate in the app? So you would go to the river and take, for example, this picture at one day, and you insert this virtual stuff gauge into that image, just like a sticker. And then you would add this to the app. You would have you would get a spot on the map, and you would get this reference image right here. If you would then go to the same stream on another day, you would maybe encounter this situation, and you would then be able to take out the app and open up this spot, click on this plus to add a new measurement, and then you see the reference image from the previous day. So then you can decide on the actual water level class based on this reference image. You would see that, okay, the water on the right image is now above this rock here, but still below this whitish line here. So it must be class one. So again, you can enter class one, you take a new picture and enter that you have chosen class one. And over time you would get a nice um, representation of the dynamics of the stream flow in the, in the river. 
or the water levels actually in the river. So how accurate are these um, crowd-based water level class ex estimates? So in this, um, in this study, uh, I looked at the, the accuracy of the data from the app, but also from some letterboxes with forms that are placed on several Swiss rivers. So we placed 12 letterboxes with uh, forms in 12 locations all over Switzerland. And we also chose 12, uh, nine locations, sorry, nine locations from the app where actual real citizen scientists put up uh, a new station. And we also chose this selection based on, on uh, places where there was also a measurement, reference measurements available. And here it is the same for the pen and paper stations. There were also reference measurements available, either by ourselves or by authorities or other universities. Um, okay, so the results of the crowdsourced estimates from the app, you can see here on the left, these are the two, yeah, the two nicest examples, I have to say. So you, you see a very nice correlation between the water level classes in the app here on the x-axis and on the y-axis, you see the measured water levels in the vicinity of that app station. And you can see we use the Kendall's tau here. So here the, the correlation is, is pretty good. And you also see also visually that these, um, yeah, that basically a higher class from the app also correlates very well with a higher measured water level in the stream. So that's very nice to see. In the forums, it was not as nice. It was a bit more, there was a bit more uncertainty and the correlation was not that good as it was in the app. And the reason for that is what we think, um, because in the app, you see here this N part, the number of participants contributing to, to that one station is very low. That's three to four. And actually, one person made most of these measurements, whereas in the app at the pen and paper stations with the forums, there were many people contributing individually to that station. So I think that in the app, that one person learned it but somehow and was much more consistent with his or her estimates. Whereas at the pen and paper stations, many more people contributed and everyone might do it a bit differently or understand the concept a bit differently. And that's why you get this spread or more uncertainty because not everyone might understand it. So just as kind of the proof, um, this is the Kendall's Tau and we just looked at if this the app um, stations were significantly better in terms of the correlation between measured and observed water levels, and they actually were significantly better from the app compared to these pen and paper stations. And another nice thing I would like to show you um, is this one here. So you see again the same station, this A3 in Salzach, and you see the time series, a uh, small excerpt from the time series from that station, and you see that there's actually also high flow and low flow values selected. And if we have a look at this image, it also tells us that people actually also go out or also observe low flows and also high flows. You also see that on this flow duration curve here, we have in black, the black line is the, of the measured water levels from the Austrian authorities during the same time as we also had observations from the app. And you see that the people actually also made observations during high flows and also during the low flows. So that's very nice to see that we get the entire spectrum more or less of the of the water level fluctuations. So again, a small summary of that. We had people measuring with the app and with the pen and, at the pen and paper stations. And you see it's always a different person at the pen, pen and paper stations, whereas in the app, it was mostly the same person. And then the, the finding from this study was that the estimates are better if one person contributes multiple times, as it is, for example, the case with the app. Good. Then you might also ask yourself, why would people actually contribute to such a project? Why would they be motivated to do that? And that's exactly what I asked myself as well. And I sent out um, a questionnaire to our participants where they had to answer or to give their agreement basically to uh, 64 um, statements that I just presented to them. And these were, for example, I want to contribute to the future of humanity, or I want to spend more time in nature, I'm seeking fame, or I'm just interested in the topic of this project. And they could give their agreement on a Likert scale, 
from like I don't agree at all to fully agree or if they thought the question was not accept applicable to them they could click that as well and I made two different parts in the questionnaire I first asked them why did you initially join the project and then in the fulfillment part I also asked them what did the participation give you could you actually for example um, spend more time in nature and so on I then grouped all these items according to this scheme from Schwartz et al. And this scheme should encompass all hu potential human motivations that lead people into action. So on this, here you see, for example, the more conservative motivations. So I wanna be conform to um, social norms, for example, or I'm a traditional person, I wanna be secure and belong to other people. This is uh, opposed to the openness to change, learning something new, challenging oneself and doing new things. And on this side, we have the self-enhancement. So this is achieving goals and having, um, being better than others, um, earning money, the resources stuff, for example. And this is very much opposed to the self-transcendence part, which is about caring for others, caring for nature, for society, or teach others. So the results of this survey were the following. We see that most people, so you see the agreement of the people here in blue is the agreement. So light blue is I rather agree and dark blue is I fully agree. And in the middle we have the undecided and then rather don't agree and don't agree at all in brown. And you see that the main motivations of people to join Crowdwater were from the universalistic um, part of the scheme. Of the, of the scheme. So the most of them wanted to help with research, to protect nature, the environment, but also to learn something new or to help society. These were the four main motivations. Whereas you have phase and dominate, dominance over others or achieving personal goals was rather on the lower, on the lower end. And then the questions concerning um, what was actually fulfilled by their participation was still universalism the help with research that was still very high they still they actually thought that they could help they think that they can help science with their with their participation but they also think that they can uh, help nature and then they also think it is kind of the right thing to do because the question for this category was for example i believe that this is um or participating in this project is according to my beliefs and values and you see that this has a very high agreement now. And another very nice thing for us was that they actually liked their participation. So they had fun. Hedonism is about, I enjoy participation. I have fun by contributing to the project. And that's very nice to see that they actually enjoyed the participation in the project. So I give you again a small summary with this comic. So we asked them, why do you participate in Crowdwater? And they said, yeah, I want to help science, I want to protect the environment, I want to learn something new, and I want to help society. And then we also asked them, what do you get from this participation? And they, they still say, I can actually help science, and I can actually contribute to environmental protection, but I'm also doing something good, and on top of that, it's fun. Cool. So what do you need to take home from this virtual PhD defense today? Um, so I showed you that the water level class estimates provide added value in regions where there is no stream flow data available. Then also that the contributions, contributions of the people who contributed more often, for example, with the Crowdwater app, that they were of higher quality than if just fewer people or more people contribute just a single time. And that the main motivations to join the project were to contribute to research, to protect the environment, and also to learn something and to help society. So with that, I'm at the end of this presentation and I thank you all for listening and I'm open to questions now.